Thank you for joining me today for another episode of Hunger Hunt Feast. Today, we're going to talk about your liver and how vital it is, how important it is to, uh, I mean, the many functions that it serves to metabolism of, of everything that you eat and uh, in our health and its role in how, how detrimental it is when the liver becomes insulin resistant. And so I, and many people don't realize, of course you probably do being the educated group that you are, but you realize how the liver becomes insulin resistant and, 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 and what kind of effects that can have on the formation of metabolic disease. Um, you know, the liver is, is vital for managing blood sugar. It actually manages our, controls our blood sugar, right? It metabolizes fat and sugar, uh, produces and regulates cholesterol, uh, sends antioxidants around the body, over the body, in those cholesterol, in those LDL particles. Um, it breaks down protein into glucose uh, for when we need more blood sugar. Uh, produces ketones when, when uh, glycogen is low in that liver, we need more energy from fat, breaking down fat into ketones. And when that liver, when the liver does become insulin resistant, it truly accelerates the process of metabolic disease throughout the body, far more than any other, uh, area, far more than muscle or fat, uh, fat cells becoming insulin resistant. When the liver becomes insulin resistant, Man, you are off to the races for metabolic disease. Um, now, the liver only holds about 100 grams of glycogen, so about 400 calories. Okay, so compared to muscles, it's not not very much. I mean, each muscle, yeah, I might be wrong, but you know, muscles can hold about 1,200 calories. In your whole body, right? Um, liver holds 100 grams, uh, which again it uses to stabilize blood sugar and keeping it from going too low. Or if it goes too high, it shuts off its flow to it, obviously, right? Um, but that's why you don't need to have a snack every two or three hours in order to maintain stable blood sugar, contrary to popular opinion of many health professionals, sadly, um, and, and magazine articles and uh, you know snack food marketing campaigns. The liver will break down the glycogen stored in it and release it as glucose as needed. Okay, in a healthy environment as needed. Muscles can't do this. No other organ can do this. And if it didn't do this, you wouldn't live through the day. You, you, your blood sugar would plummet and you'd, you'd die. Um, now the liver metabolizes about 80 to 90% of the fructose we eat. So obviously that's not just coming from fruit, it's juice, sodas, any kind of sugar, sucrose, right? Or high fructose corn syrup. About half of that is fructose. And so that, as that gets split, the fructose, 80% of the fructose you take goes to the liver. About 20% of the glucose would be digested in the liver because the rest of the glucose can be processed by muscles, but fructose doesn't get processed well by muscles at all. Um, and then about 80% of the alcohol you drink, some of that goes to the brain, obviously. That's why it feels so good. Uh, but about 80 or so percent of the alcohol you drink is processed in the liver as well. The uh, uh, alcohol and fructose are very similar. And a high intake of either can lead to fatty liver disease, right? Either alcoholic fatty liver disease or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which we'll talk more about. Um, as I mentioned before, the liver regulates the level of cholesterol in our blood, as well as producing the majority of it. Now, only about 10 to maybe 20% of our cholesterol is actually absorbed from our gut, from what we eat. Um, and even some of that that's absorbed from the gut has actually been reabsorbed as needed, I feel we need more, uh, after, after being, well, after it's made a cycle through the bloodstream and come back to the liver, liver sends to the gallbladder, which is then released back into the gut in the bile, bile's full of cholesterol. Uh, and then from that point, we, if we need it, we can reabsorb it to supplement what we produce, right? Or, or, uh, or let it go, and, and if we don't need it, it, it passes through the, the gut and eliminate it. So, I mean, let's see about that. If cholesterol is really bad for us, why would we produce so much of it and then reabsorb it after it's been in a place where it can be eliminated? Hmm, that's a rabbit hole for another day. Uh, but when excess sugar is brought to the liver by insulin, 
it can also store it as fat. Not only stores it as glycogen, but it only has about 100 grams of storage. And some of that might be full if you've eaten recently. Um, you know, it might be already be at half full, three quarters full. So there's not really not 100 grams of room every time you eat, is there? Uh, but it can store it as fat. So that, that glycogen or glucose is stored as fat in the liver. And the liver can package that fat, not only store it in the liver, but it can package that fat as triglycerides and send it out to be used or stored in other places in the body through the bloodstream in, in LDL particles. Uh, specifically, the, those LDL particles that, that carry a lot of triglycerides, primarily carrying triglycerides, are called VLDL, or very low density lipoprotein. And they're very low density because a large amount of triglycerides uh, leaving, which, which, which only leave room for a very small amount of cholesterol to be carried. So the more triglycerides that are carried in that LDL, the less cholesterol there is in that, in that particular particle. And it's thought that once the triglycerides are delivered by the LDL particle, the remaining limited small amount of, of cholesterol left in that LDL is what creates the small dense LDL particles that are, are thought to be so atherogenic. So, you know, because they're small and dense, they can, they can get caught in those cracks and fissures. So, so the more triglycerides we produce, the more fat we produce by the liver, right? The more atherogenic our LDL can become. Now, the liver also makes the larger LDL particles that contain primarily cholesterol and antioxidants, like the fat-soluble vitamins A, D, and E, right? Those are packaged in there with our cholesterol. But to supply our, our body with cholesterol, when needed, right? For instance, in a stressful situation where we need to make more cortisol to deal with the stress. So we need more cortisol, we, we need more cholesterol available in the bloodstream to facilitate that, to supply that. Most of the cells in our bodies uh, make their own cholesterol for like cell membrane repair and cellular division, right? making more, more cells. They need that cholesterol for, for the cell membrane. Uh, and of course, we use cholesterol to make sex hormones, vitamin D. Um, we actually have a pool of cholesterol of about 30 grams all the time. That's about 30,000. That is 30,000. 30 grams is 30,000 milligrams. Uh, but that's, that's an approximation that we have in our body all the time, whether in the liver or just pooled throughout the body. Now, why we weren't supposed to eat more than 300 milligrams a day when we're walking around with 30,000 milligrams all the time is a bit strange to me, especially when we only absorb about, oh, I don't know, 10 to 20% of it. Mm. But there's that rabbit hole again. I'm not going there today. So uh, back on track. When liver glycogen gets low and blood sugar uh, is at normal levels, allowing for low insulin or no insulin to be present, the liver can then ramp up fat and ketone production for added fuel. So you can burn some more fat and that is definitely regulated uh, in the liver. The more metabolically flexible you are, the better this process works. If you're, you know, it allows you not to have to eat as often, which makes fa fasting much easier to um, sustain and saving more glucose for the brain. Now, if you're not used, to, if you're if you're used to eating often, you're used to eating kind of a carby meal, and you switch to um, a lower a low carb diet or some intermittent fasting schedule, then and and you haven't developed um, this metabolic flexibility at the level you need to, where your your body can ramp up ketone production quickly, and your body and your muscles and and, and other um, tissues can utilize that keep ke those ketones effectively, efficiently. Then it may take some time to get used to, and you kind of feel that sluggishness and lethargy and right, you know, that you know what I'm talking about, the, the carb flu. Um, but that process can easily be developed over a matter of a few weeks. So um, that is the metabolic flexibility you want to achieve so that this natural process, when blood sugar is low and you haven't eaten for a while, takes place to supplement your blood sugar or your energy needs. With, and low blood sugar with stored fat. That is ideal, right? So again, it allows you not to have to eat as often, making fasting easier to sustain, which 
in that case, in that situation, it's saving more glucose for the brain, which is the most glucose hungry, energy burning organ in your body. Now the brain does use ketones, but it requires a percentage, at least a minimum percentage of its fuel to be glucose. The ketones alone can't keep up with energy needs. It just can't. Um, now that doesn't, I'm not saying you have to eat glucose. Okay. So there's that argument. People say, oh, you need glucose. You need sugar. You need, well, your body definitely needs to use glucose and use sugar. That's different than saying you have to eat it. I said the brain needs it. Needs a percentage of minimum percentage of its fuel to be glucose. Now, if you don't eat it, where does more glucose come from? for balancing your blood sugar and fueling your brain and the other organs or, or any other strenuous activity, right? Well, the liver, the magical, wonderful, miraculous liver that it is, can break down amino acids into glucose. It can turn protein into sugar. Now, either from protein from your gut or stored proteins from muscle, or even bone, if necessary, pull the protein out of your bone. Um, under, say, someone's not eating enough protein in a situation where you're, you're just not getting enough protein for your needs, it'll break it down from what you got, which are your tissues in order to keep you alive, just to keep your blood sugar stable. So the stress hormone cortisol stimulates the breakdown of amino acids into glucose, ideally for energy for a stressful situation. This does not happen, contrary to some people's belief, because you ate a lot of protein. It will break down amino acids into glucose as needed. And it will do it whether you're eating a lot of protein or not. It'll take it from somewhere. So that's why it's probably beneficial to eat a decent amount of protein. Uh, so that you're not breaking it down from tissues when you're in a situation where you're busy, you're doing something active, energy is low, um, you know, exercise, physical labor, it could be giving a speech, you're nervous, it could be an argument, it could be as, 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 or something, bad sleep, right? Cortisol actually elevates to wake us up in the morning. Uh, raises our heart rate, tells the liver to release some glucose for a little more energy to start the day, actually like a little internal breakfast there, if you will, but just to pick us up, to get us out of bed, on our feet, out in the hunt, right? So with the liver being so involved in blood sugar regulations, blood sugar regulation, excuse me, and, and blood lipid regulation, ketone production, processing alcohol, uh, I mean, you can see that if, the liver becomes insulin resistant, you've got a serious problem. So let's take a little closer look at that. Uh, in an environment where you have high blood sugar from the diet and elevated insulin levels, where maybe you know, muscle or fat cells have already become insulin resistant, providing fewer places for sugar to be stored by insulin, um, but, but not necessarily that the liver is full of glycogen. Okay, so um, at this point, the, the liver has probably started storing the glucose as fat. Okay, so um, liver may not be insulin resistant yet, but say other tissues are. In any case, whether they are or not, if you have excess blood sugar coming to the liver, liver might be full of glycogen, it can't take any more, but it might start storing it as fat. Okay, um, but it's like, hey, we've got enough. I don't want any more fat. The liver doesn't function well with a lot of fat stored in it. And if it's already full of glycogen, it's going to say, hey, you know, we don't need any more. So it's going to retract its insulin receptors to stop the incoming fuel that it doesn't need. Or this could be created in the case of excessive inflammation or inflammatory proteins like cytokines in the blood or, from, you know, the spillover of inflammatory proteins from overstuffed, diseased fat cells that become insulin resistant saying no more. And then they start eating disease and spilling fat and these inflammatory proteins into the bloodstream as a way to, you know, because it has, they got nowhere else to go. And a lot of times that fat ends up coming to the visceral area and getting stored in the liver and the visceral 
um, part of the body, you know, in your trunk, in and around the organs, as well as a layer of fat just uh, below the muscle, but the, the nice layer of fat being laid down there. Um, or it could come from oxidized fat, from too much, you know, polyunsaturated fatty acids, too much PUFA oil, uh, like soybean or cottonseed oil. Those can cause inflammation, especially, you know, oxidized, uh, which most of them are by the time we get to them, if they're in the form of a food additive. Um, so that inflammation damages the proteins involved in the function of the insulin receptors. So uh, anyway, insulin in any case should tell, when the insulin reaches the, the liver, it should tell the liver to stop releasing glucose in the blood because there's already too much glucose present. That makes sense, right? You know, if you already have high glucose, you're trying to, your insulin's released, trying to store it somewhere, trying to control and lower glucose levels, you don't want the liver continuing to pump glucose into the bloodstream, do you? It's not low. Uh, insulin is there, you know, to, to store it. And there's fat or it's glycogen in muscles, fat in muscles, fat in the, in the fat cells or, uh, or in the liver. And so as fat builds up in the liver, it becomes more insulin resistant as well as being on the path to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or if it's from, from alcohol, from alcoholic fatty liver disease. But uh, when, the, when the liver is insulin resistant, it stops responding to the insulin, obviously, and continues to release glucose into the bloodstream, adding to the, the, you know, your glucose levels. And of course, that triggers the release of even more insulin. So you have rising glucose levels, rising insulin levels. Now this added insulin could be enough to shove glucose into other tissues like the muscles or the fat cells that might've become resistant to insulin at a certain level. And so the goal of, of the, the body's goal of raising insulin is to help shove that energy into other tissues to get it out, to basically keep you from dying, right? To keep, keep blood sugar levels at a, at a level that it can sustain. Um, for life, <laughs> well, um, but eventually over time, even that stops working, they become more insulin resistant and then the blood sugar continues to rise and insulin stays high and it becomes a systemic issue. So this is not only when blood sugar would be chronically high, but also fasting insulin levels will increase. So, you know, your insulin levels are high. Even if you haven't eaten, they become chronic, you have chronic insulin um, high insulin levels, chronic hyperinsulinemia is the term. So lead, that would lead to really full body insulin resistance. If it hasn't already happened, you're, you just got insulin resistance um, increasing throughout the body, through the other tissues. And then these climbing blood sugar and insulin levels lead to type two diabetes and or heart disease, right? Generally, if you get one, you're very high risk of getting the other. They're like sisters, really. But insulin resistance drives both of those diseases, right? The fatty liver is desperately trying to get rid of the fat stored in it. So it packages it up as triglycerides and sends it out via LDL, as we talked about before, to be stored elsewhere, right? Often the visceral area around the other organs, in and around the other organs, uh, you know, the pancreas, the heart, kidneys, you know, um, it's, it's a problem. It's the most hormonally dangerous type of fat, the visceral fat, because it affects the organs, organ function, and particularly the liver, as we're seeing how, how much that accelerates the process of metabolic disease. The high blood sugar, the insulin, the inflammatory proteins circulating in the bloodstream can cause damage to the endothelial lining of your arteries. So our immune system then responds with like the macrophages, right? Comes out to repair the, the cracked and inflamed sticky tissue. And then the, our small dense LDL particles after, after dumping the triglycerides um, are now bouncing by and happen to get caught in this construction zone, in this repair zone, however you want to call it, where our, our macrophages are in there trying to shore up and, and seal up these, these inflamed, this inflamed tissue. Um, 
And so that those small dense LDL particles become part of the foam cells being used to patch up the arterial lining with plaque within the plaque formation, essentially. Now, in an insulin sensitive environment, without the inflammation of insulin and the inflammatory proteins, the oxidized PUFA fats, the polyunsaturated fats, uh, that small dense LDL particle is more likely to just bounce on by and continue back to the liver to be recycled, right, for later use. And you would also have a fewer number of them because an insulin sensitive body won't have as many triglyceride carrying VLDL particles pumped out by a healthy non-fatty liver. So fewer particles, less risk of them getting caught in a, in a plaque buildup, right? More particles, more risk. Pretty simple, right? Now, fatty liver is extremely common in overweight people, obviously, who generally have some level of insulin resistance anyway. Um, usually begins once those some fat cells become insulin resistant, they start spilling out the fats and inflammatory proteins, like I mentioned before. Um, but you can be normal weight, still have fatty liver disease, pumping out triglycerides with insulin resistance in the liver. Okay, it just depends. It can depend on your fat threshold, it can depend on your diet, what you're eating. Um, there are certain genetic populations that tend to have to not get obese, but to get fatty liver and insulin resistance sooner. They just don't put the fat, their, their fat threshold is hit sooner before it gets really big. Uh, instead of duplicating fat cells, they just big, they get kind of big and sick early, start spilling that fat out, it goes to the visceral. So they tend to have maybe skinnier arms and legs and upper body, but their, but their torso, especially their, their, around their stomach, their waist, uh, it gets bigger because that's where the, the fat's going to their visceral area. Um, so they're, 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 their insulin resistance can come without the obesity, which is actually, it means it comes sooner. <laughs> it's much, much less healthy. Um, but again, you know, this is generally um, the fatty liver, fat in the liver is caused by alcohol or excessive consumption of fructose, sugar, light drinks like soda, juice. Um, eating fruit's fine, usually slowed down by the fiber of the fruit. So the dosage of the, of the fructose is processed uh, slower, right? So it's easier to, to manage that when it's coming in a little slower, as opposed to like a soda, which is, delivers it very quickly. And remember 80% of the fructose processed in the liver. 20% of the glucose, as I mentioned. Um, but, you know, the soda, the juice, the alcoholic drinks, those drive fatty liver because that's where those particular um, nutrients, if you want to call them that, are primarily processed and the liver is quickly overwhelmed with enough fuel that it just has to store it as fat. Now, approximately 25% of adults in the U.S. have fatty liver disease. Now, we can also estimate that about 25% have type 2 diabetes, whether it's diagnosed or not, you know, it's diagnosed or undiagnosed, right? Another 25% are probably headed that direction, so considered pre-diabetic, which is extreme insulin resistance developing into diabetes. And a third 25% or more are probably just, you know, have some level of maybe more, more mild insulin resistance. Um, in fact, the current estimation is that about 85% of US adults actually have some level of insulin resistance, which would of course include all three of those categories. Uh, and that drives hypertension, uh, high oxidized or highly oxidized or, or small dense LDL particles. Uh, now you can have some non-dietary driven insulin resistance, one, one of them is, is stress, uh, cortisol. So if you have a lot of stress, you have elevated cortisol levels, so say chronically elevated cortisol. Cortisol is supposed to be released during a workout, during you know, um, a sport, during a moment where you, you, you know, physical labor, uh, a moment when you need, to do, you need to do something active, you know, fight or flight, right? Um, but chronic elevated, chronically elevated cortisol from either like say a lack of sleep, or high emotional stress 
uh, that can also elevate blood sugar, right? Which elevates insulin. And then you get the cravings for the energy dense food as a result of the blood sugar swings, right? That stimulates those cravings for energy dense, usually nutrient poor food, right? You usually want the worst things to eat, to, to calm that, right? Or to feed that, feed the, the blood sugar swings. Uh, cortisol signals a level of insulin resistance in the body to allow the blood sugar to be available to the muscles that are actually doing the work who are dealing with the stressful situation. So if it's running so that the blood sugar being released by the cortisol stimulation goes to those muscles, because it, you know, so if everything else is insulin resistant, okay, um, you, those working muscles don't need insulin to use the glucose in the blood, to use the blood sugar. The working muscles can absorb it without insulin. But that insulin resistance keeps the fat cells and the other non-active muscle cells and other tissues from picking up the glucose instead of those muscles, right? So it's kind of whatever it's released in that moment of fight or flight is meant for whatever working muscles are, are, are in need and demanding it. But the other ones are protected by the are protected. Well, the glucose is protected from being absorbed by non-essential tissue at that moment um, by the insulin resistance. Now, obviously if there's from a lack of sleep or emotional stress, like an argument, traffic, whatever, you know, uh, giving a speech, uh, there's no physical exertion for those muscles, is there? So eventually that glucose does end up being stored as fat, often in the visceral area. But, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's primarily, for most people, a dietary problem, the dietary solution, right? For most, most people, it's, it comes from how they eat. Yes, sleep can certainly add to that problem. Sleep is vital. Make sure you get, you're getting enough quality sleep so that cortisol levels and insulin levels are not elevated throughout your day. And that can happen in a matter of four, three, four days of bad sleep has been shown clinically. Um, and, or if you have just constant emotional stress, high stress job, high stress, you know, living situation, uh, that can cause that. I mean, certainly would add to, uh, an existing problem or keep, or maybe hold back, you know, keep you from making progress or trigger cravings. Um, but for most people and for most of the time in a, in a severe sense, in a severe case, it's, it's a dietary problem. And nothing beats fasting, really, for burning off fat and liver. But 16 hours, 20 hours, 24 hours, longer, 48 hours. Nothing beats just elimination of all nutrients for reversing insulin resistance, burning off fat and liver, resetting insulin levels, getting those to come down, right? Your fasting insulin levels. And then when you do eat, make sure the majority of your meal is made up of fatty meat. So it's got a very low impact on insulin. It's gonna give you the nutrients you need and uh, have, have a, and with, with less of an energy delivery to your system of unnecessary excess energy. So fasting, mostly fat, eat mostly fatty meat, try to move frequently. Have a great week.